Hey, Christ Church people, Terry Eggers says hello. She's watching. And Mr. Camera Operator, would you be so kind as to take the spy cam and just spin and catch the crowd? Thank you. I don't know if you remember or not. I know most of you who have been here that long do remember that um, my first sermon, and I don't know if you remember everything that I said, but I made you all a promise that day. So I want to be sure that you uh, recall that promise and I, I want to acknowledge today that I have, as of today, fulfilled that promise. <clears throat> I promised, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that I would make everyone in our church happy. <laughs> some of you when I came and some of you when I leave. So now is the fulfillment of that promise. It's a promise that every Methodist pastor can make with absolute assurance. So, pray with me and for me, please. Gracious God, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, you who are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Confession time. I really didn't think I'd be sitting here seven years later. I'm a preacher. I should know better. But uh, shortly after I got here, I had a small group of people come to me and sit down with all of the markers, all of the records <clears throat> of where you all were and the history of getting you to that point. And uh, as somebody that's been doing this for about 40 years now, I recognized all of the signs. And it looked like roughly somewhere between 16 to 26 months before you all hit something that is institutionally called critical inertia. It's a, it's a point that any institution, but we use it a lot in congregational development and talking about um, uh, the health and vitality of churches, that critical inertia is a point at which there's no return. And once you hit that, the only thing that you really can do as a pastor is begin the process of hospice care. Um, how to help the church die well, basically. And, uh, I talked to you about that my first Sunday and um, was, was pretty honest with you. Maxine Cutting, who at almost 100 years, just a few months ago, retired from our congregation to the church triumphant. Maxine loved rubbing my nose in that sermon and said, you told us that we weren't going to make it, which is not really true. And we laughed and we celebrated together the fact that we're still here. We're still here after suffering through a global pandemic. For three years, we didn't come into this space. For three years, I stood right here. Let me show you. I think we finally got the sticky tape up off the floor, but I stood right here. The camera was right there. That way we could pick up the piano behind us, and you could watch us um, so that you could 
at least feel connected to this space that means so much to you. And we, um, we found our way through it. We built a school temporarily, had a school in our education wing where we had uh, our middle high and senior high kids from the area were in closely graded gender separate groups in, in our classrooms and they could come here under strict protocol, do their lessons, uh, have outdoor recreation, have access to the few restaurants that were open downtown. That way they got a little bit of socialization. I think we did that for a year and a half maybe um, during that time, but we survived it. And I I've done a lot of things in 40 years. And I'm going to tell you right now, the proudest thing that I will always lay claim to is we did not lose one single member of this church to that dreaded disease, that dreaded virus. We did all the right things, all the right ways, and I badgered you to death about it. But we stayed healthy, we stayed connected. We have weathered together and we have survived the separation of our church. First United Methodist Church has a long standing been a congregation that has an open door and an open heart and an open mind to people and, and welcomes all. And uh, I, I told you again my first Sunday I would be pastor to all or none. That was just going to be the way of it. And unbeknownst to us in our coming together, we've, we've seen a number of our brothers and sisters in Christ discern that they needed something different to believe, something different to hold fast, something different. And we've seen their departure. But as a part of that, we have grown. We did not get smaller because there are people sitting in this room right now because they found themselves no longer at home in their home church. And you welcomed them with open arms. You invited them into this space. You befriended them. They have become a part of our life together. Um, it has been a very interesting adventure with you. And a part of this has been this lovely old building. It is a beautiful space. The air conditioner here that y'all spent a whole lot of money on before I got here, the air conditioner stopped working. And we had technicians in and out of the building. And I saw one of the technicians and I said, What's the good word? And he said, Well, preacher, in technical terms, let me put it to you like this. Your stuff is broke. When I got here, you had about a half a million dollars in deferred maintenance, stuff that just kept being put off because there weren't resources to get it done. And uh, we kept cobbling together pots of money to make that happen. And I want to say a special, oh, there I, I want to say a special word of thanks to Fred Hart. Uh, Fred has, has done a yeoman's job in short order of uh, getting some things done, getting the outside of the building uh, fixed. Uh, prior to that. We've, it took a long time, but we finally got every air conditioner in this facility working again. We uh, painted and sealed and cleaned the ceiling. We changed out the lights to make it brighter in here. And, and we renovated our office space. The list just goes on and on and on of things that I just, I didn't know if we could get it done or not, but we did. I was told this the first week I was here. And it has proven out to be true. I was told this. I, I, I was told that 
If, if this church was to close tomorrow, a group of people would find a way to buy it back and start over because there was that much dedication here. And that's what I've experienced every step of the way. hundred and seventy-ish years ago, your forebears planted seeds here. First, where the bank now sits. The first churches all met together. First Presbyterian, First Baptist, and First Methodist. All met in a beautiful little building that is where First Bank, where we, by the way, now stands. And outgrowing that space, we moved across the street where the Lutherans are right now. And outgrowing that space, this church moved down the block, down the block about two blocks, um, where Pat, where are you? Where Pat Moncrief lives. Your house is on top of our old property. You wondered why it was such sacred space, didn't you? And the city wanted it and needed it, and so we came right back here where it started. Now, there used to be a cemetery out back. If you've ever been here at night, never mind. When you know, you know. <laughs> but we're right back where we started. This church is the most mobile congregation that I've ever served. You all have moved four times, never more than a, two blocks from where you were. And in 1952, this happened. I, I, I take that short history walk with you to say, wow, for close to two centuries, people in this community have believed in the power of a living and loving God so much that they would give and do anything and everything to make it possible. To have a church, to be a mission and a, and a ministry and a witness to the community. And I do appreciate your presence here today. I, I, it means a lot that you came out for this last sermon, but I know why you're here also. You're here because of what this church has meant to you and your family. And for some of you, what has meant for generations to your family. And there have been tight times and difficult times and challenging times and tense, tense times. But we're still here because of the strength of the seed of the farmers that come before us. See, we don't know from farming so much. You got to have good seed. You got to have good soil. You got to have a crop that's tended well. You have to have dedication. And you have to hope. <clears throat> in the unexpected, in the unseen, in the uncertain, you have to hope that it is going to bear fruit. There's a lot of fruit in this room. Some nuts too, but there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of fruit in this room. Mike, why did you look at me funny when I said there were nuts in the room? You did, were you taking it personal? Might have been met that way. <laughs> Love you, man. That's the nature of what we do. That's why I came here seven years ago. It's also why I'm leaving you. So let's talk about that for a minute, because there's things you should know. I've been getting a lot of questions, and so let me take you through a process. The decision to leave was mine and mine alone.
please know that it's not because I don't love you, it's because I do love you. I came to recognize and understand that I had given you everything that I had came here to give and that it is time to bring a new farmer to the field, someone with different skills, different knowledge, different experience, and different expertise. That's never an easy decision for me because everywhere I go, I plan to retire, right, Linda? The folks at Christ Church knew that I was going to be there until um, I retired or they killed me, one or the other. Um, everywhere I go, I, I, I plan to be there that long. And then something happens. And I become aware that God is tapping me on the shoulder and it's, it's time to do something new. And I called my district superintendent on the last day of the last cabinet, of the first day of the last cabinet meeting. And I said, David, I, I, I have to go. It's time to move. I realize it's late. And we have made one thing very clear. And by we, I mean Holly and I, which goes to your next question. Holly and I have made it very clear to our district superintendents that our first yes was to the church. When Holly was ordained, when I was ordained, the Bishop of the Western North Carolina Annual Conference looked me in the eye, looked her in the eye, and we were asked the same question ten years apart. Will you go where you are sent with a glad heart? And we stand before the annual conference and we make that profession. Yes, we will. And Holly and I both throughout the whole course of our, our separate ministries, that has been a number one value that we've held. When a bishop tells us this is where we're going, then we go. So... Our commitment to each other came after that. And it is equally important, but one of those commitments came first. When we started dating, we talked about that. When we got engaged, we talked about that. When we got married, we've talked about that because we've always known that it was a possibility that we might be separated by distance. In this case, Holly's in Spruce Pine. I'm going to be in Franklin. It's two hours and two minutes door to door. My daughter lives in the middle in Asheville at UNC Asheville. It's going to be difficult news to her three sweet mates that we're going to be spending a lot of time there, maybe overnight. We don't think that's going to go over well with the housing department there. We told our superintendents, do not make my appointment, which is coming late, have anything to do with Holly's. Give her the best possible opportunity. She's moving to Spruce Pine, United Methodist Church. They asked for a woman. They asked for someone who was open to full inclusion of all people. They ask for someone who is dedicated to local mission and ministry. And they have a literacy program that they run that the school system buses children to at their church. Holly's been involved in Smart Start for the last four years and is a part of the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. Do you think that maybe this was a good match? She's getting a little bit of a bump up the ladder. She's in Mitchell County, and Spruce Pine is the only remaining United Methodist Church in Mitchell County. They're a lighthouse church, and they're literally on the highest hill in the community. I was prepared to go anywhere, and I was shocked when I got the phone call letting me know that they wanted me to go to Spruce Pine. 
dear friend of mine has served there for 12 years, David Beam and his lovely wife, Angie, two of the sweetest, kindest, nicest, nicest, neatest persons I know, went there 12 years ago, eight years ago, she was diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer. And she died eight months ago. David needs to go somewhere. And he refused to move. He would not say yes to his superintendent until he knew who was coming. And when David was told it was me, he relinquished and he is moving to Mount Tabor United Methodist Church in Winston-Salem where I used to serve as the associate pastor. You reckon God's in this? Huh. Y'all got to pray for those people in Franklin because nice, sweet, kind, that's them, not me. I've been there for a couple of days. They were lovely to me. Um, it seems like a wonderful thing. How are you and Holly going to manage? Well, uh, we were separate when we were dating, and uh, only 20 minutes, but we had jobs. We worked all week, and so we generally only saw each other about once a week. Uh, and, and a lot of that we had to sneak around because we weren't quite sure yet, and we knew if Miss Kay found out about it, it'd be all over. <laughs> and you did too, didn't? Didn't somebody tell you? I think somebody told you. I don't remember. Did I? Oh, I told you. I did. I outed myself. Um, We've always known this was a possibility. I have a friend, we have a friend, she is a pastor of North Wilkesbury United Methodist Church. Her husband is a Navy chaplain. He's on deployment to Qatar. We know as United Methodist pastors, this is a given for clergy couples. Sometimes that both of you are in the same church, sometimes you're far apart. But again, there's a yes that we say, and then there's another yes that we say to our spouses. We're going to travel, both of us. We'll drive two hours from point to point every other week. That's our plan. Our churches know. They understand. They've met both of us. And um, we are just going to have to be dedicated to it. And, and I do appreciate your concern for us. Uh, it has meant a great deal. So thank you for that. Uh, what happens now? Um, we're going to a new conference for this coming week. And the following week, we're packing up the truck uh, at the Parsonage Monday and Tuesday. Um, I think Johnny's helping around some folks up. So if you see Johnny coming at you with intent, just know. Um, and then sometime the first couple of days, two weeks, uh, I'll be moving. I'm, uh, Saxon will be here this coming Sunday uh, to, to preach. And our youth and children will be in charge of the service on the 30th. Uh, you'll be hearing some about their uh, w wonderful, marvelous, incredible trip to White Lake and all the mission work that they did there. And it was another astonishing week. Now, <clears throat> part of the last part. I can't come back, y'all. We have a covenant, United Methodist pastors have a covenant that for one year, you're not going to see me. I won't come to funerals. I won't, I won't, I won't uh, come and preach. Um... I won't lurk about in the town, although I am very concerned for Silver Creek Diner. <laughs> and uh, but we are all right. Um, we 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 have that covenant so that 
our, our successors can get rooted deeply in your lives. My friend Dan Hester, his beautiful wife Julie, are wonderful human beings. When I found out that Dan was coming, I was ecstatic. Absolutely ecstatic. <clears throat> because I felt the same way that David felt when he found out I was going there. Um, he is a fantastic practitioner of ministry. His wardrobe is a little lacking. <laughs> so y'all help him out. And he is very excited about y'all. He is very excited about coming here. Um, he's been through a lot where he is. And he needs a different kind of experience that you all can provide him. So I'm excited for that. Uh, I think I'm telling you most of what I need to know. Oh, one other thing. 775 Country Club Drive, Franklin, North Carolina. That's my address. It'll be in the bulletin. You come and visit me anytime. You call me up anytime. You email me anytime. You come visit my church at 66 Harrison Avenue in downtown Franklin, North Carolina. You come anytime. Just make sure I'm there before you come. Um, love to see you. See, while I'm not supposed to come back here for a year, you, you can come in on the 14th of July on my first Sunday if you want. Uh, you can come anytime. And I can respond to anything. I just cannot initiate and I cannot come back. And that's in order to be fair to Dan and, and to help him. All of this, I know it doesn't feel like much of a sermon or seem like much of a sermon, but I want to assure you this, every bit of this is about properly working the ground and planting the seeds. The right seed to the right ground in the right way. The Western North Carolina Cabinet has taken great care in making these appointments. And they've had direct conversation with Holly and I. Our bishop talked to both of us recently to tell us how excited he was for where we were going and for who was following. So be in prayer for us. We will be in prayer for you. I am and will remain eternally grateful for the opportunity to have been here. You have taught me much. I've tried to learn it, but I've got more learning to do, got more work to do, more vineyards to be in, and just know from the bottom of my heart how much that I love and appreciate this congregation, this town, this community. You all know the investment that I've tried to make here. Um, and I'm, I'm honored to have had those opportunities as well. And God bless you, each and every one of you, and your little pee-picking hearts. And come see me, because I like seeing y'all. But I can't do that for a while. But y'all can come anytime. And it's Franklin. It's a vacation spot. Lake, mountains, downtown eateries, downtown eateries and downtown eateries.